Uh, I'm uh, working under the guidance of uh, Professor Shreena Srinivasan. So thanks a lot for having me here. And uh, it's wonderful to talk about my research and also know about what is being done at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, so yeah, the title of my uh, talk and also it's uh, my PhD thesis research, it's titled uh, Computational Transcendence for uh, Emergent Responsible Autonomy. And uh, we, uh, so this is basically a model which we are proposing, which leads to emergent responsible behavior by autonomous agents. Uh, so this is a, a overview of my talk. Uh, firstly, uh, I'll be introducing this model of computational transcendence. Uh, I'll discuss in detail how we uh, formally mathematically model it. And also, uh, for example, in case of prisoner's dilemma, how it uh, pans out. Next, we'll have a look at uh, some of the applications of CT. So more specifically, we'll look at uh, supply chain uh, scenarios and traffic management and how uh, this model leads to responsible behavior by autonomous agents in those contexts. And finally, uh, we'll conclude. So we can get started. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, these days uh, autonomous agents are getting more and more uh, common. Uh, for example, from uh, usual chatbots, which uh, just uh, respond to different kinds of user queries to uh, bots, like in case of autonomous vehicles, autonomous drones, and even uh, uh, autonomous missiles and so on. So there are so many use cases where uh, autonomous agents are being used. And the point is that uh, these uh, these agents don't act, uh, don't operate in isolation. They operate in systems where there are other agents as well as there are uh, humans. And thus it becomes very crucial and important that they act responsibly uh, since their uh, actions have implications on everyone, right? So, uh, in that context, uh, we say that uh, following are some of the characteristics of uh, responsible AI, which we would, uh, want to have in the models. So, so far in the literature, when we checked, uh, uh, like responsible AI kind of systems are built using two approaches. One is the top-down approach where there's an existing autonomous agent uh, using uh, some model. And then there is a layer which is added on top so that it acts uh, uh, responsibly. So by that, for example, it might mean uh, following some rules or not. <laughs> so enforced, uh, enforced uh, by some kind of system. On the other hand, there are bottom-up approaches where uh, based on, let's say, the positive and negative reinforcements from the system, the agent learns um, uh, how it should operate uh, in the system. So that's a, a bottom-up or emergent approach. And there are also hybrid approaches which combine both these two techniques. So CT, which we are proposing, is also a hybrid model. Next uh, point which uh, we would like to have in any uh, responsible AI kind of systems is uh, the agent should be uh, such that they should be able to balance this cost of responsibility and self-interest. So by that, I, I mean that uh, in any context when we take an autonomous agent, for it to act responsibly, it incurs some cost, right? It comes at some cost. And also on the other hand, it is operating in a system such that it can maximize its self-interest. So uh, there are these two things which is happening in parallel. And the point is, how do we make sure that uh, autonomous agents by themselves are able to balance both these things out? And the third and crucial point is, uh, so, uh, so far in the literature, if we see uh, autonomous agents are mostly just a single agent. People see, for example, let's say a trolley problem. Will this agent act responsibly or not? So it's a uh, single agent is taken, taken in isolation, but I think that doesn't help. In most scenarios, autonomous agents operate in systems where there are other agents and they're interacting and uh, it's almost many times an open world systems and so on. So the point is in the uh, model design itself, how do we make sure that in a multi-agent kind of scenario, uh, these autonomous agents act responsibly? So th the point is it should be part of the model design itself. Uh, so, okay, moving ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know uh, responsibility ethics, these are huge terms and in different kinds of scenarios, they mean so many different things. We are looking at responsibility in a very specific, uh, in very specific terms. So um, uh, we say that uh, any autonomous agents in most scenarios faces this dilemma of responsibility. By that, I mean, um, so uh, there are some choices which the agent uh, uh, faces, which are individually very good for the agent, but for the collective, let's say they're not so good. 
on the other hand there are some kind of choices or actions which are individually suboptimal for the agent but for the collective it's very good so the second kind of uh, actions uh, or choices we are saying are the responsible choice and how do we make sure autonomous agents when they are uh, operating in systems by themselves make the second kind of choices so that's the overall big picture and uh, yeah so that's uh, that's our uh, or, like motivation for developing ct so moving ahead um, uh, this is more from a human being's point of view. Any uh, person, right, has this elastic sense of self. So I'll elaborate more on that. So of course, we identify with ourselves, our mind, our body, and so on. But in different contexts, we identify with different things, right? So at home, uh, we identify with our families, we identify with our homes, and so on. In our workplaces, we identify with our teams, we identify with our profession, and those things matter to us. And even at the global scale, like we care about the environment, uh, uh, and so on. So the point is, uh, in different contexts, when we are operating, uh, we identify with different things. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the goal here is, can we model something like this elastic sense of self in autonomous agents as well? And our, um, our motivation was that probably this kind of model uh, will lead to responsible behavior. And at least in the uh, work which we have tried so far, it does. And I'll elaborate more on that. So uh, coming to computational transcendence and its formal definition, transcendence, we define it as the capability of any autonomous agent uh, so that it can extend its sense of self to different aspects of the system. So these can be like other agents which are there in the system. So let's say an autonomous agent is interacting with some other agents, uh, let's say it's uh, in, in its neighborhood and so on. Uh, so uh, can, uh, it can extend its identity to those. Next is group of agents. So let's say an agent is part of a team and so on. So uh, it can identify with that group. And finally, even to abstract notions or concepts. So for example, uh, in the traffic context, we'll see how the uh, agent identifies with metrics like emissions and so on. So uh, that's how we define uh, computational transcendence. And uh, here I would like to highlight this difference between the two kinds of associations, right? So traditionally in game theory uh, and uh, these kinds of settings, it's a rational association. So let's say when two agents uh, interact with each other, uh, they, they continue their interaction as long as it rationally makes sense. As, the, as long as they get a positive payoff, they'll keep on that interaction. But let's say uh, it, uh, they get a negative uh, payoff or utility, they, they break that edge and that's fine with them. But uh, using CT, we are modeling this different kind of association, which we are calling as the association of identity. So in that, uh, the... Uh, uh, the edge or the interaction is part of the strategy and uh, once the uh, the agent identifies with the other agent so what happens is the um, the in self interest of the other agent is part of this agent because it identifies with that agent and we call it the association of identity and it's not uh, so transactional so let's say if you get a negative uh, utility you won't just break that connection off uh, the agent tries to uh, over time uh, adjust so that it can um, operate in these kinds of systems so and and the point here was that ct is used to model more the association of identity rather than the rational associations kind of uh, interactions. So uh, yeah, coming to the mathematical model, uh, formally, uh, let's say a transcendent agent A is uh, defined something as follows. So IA denotes uh, the identity objects. So it is the set of objects with it, which it identifies with. These can be like we discussed, these can be other agents, group of agents or abstract concepts. Gamma denotes the transcendence level or elasticity. So basically how much it identifies with others. So a low gamma agent is a self-centered agent. So it cares only about what utility it gets. On the other hand, a, uh, an agent with a high gamma value is someone who identifies a lot with others and takes into account others to a large extent. So uh, that's what gamma denotes. And finally, we have this D, which is the semantic distance. So basically, if there are multiple aspects in its identity set, so D denotes the distance to each uh, aspect uh, in, in its identity set. Um, moving ahead, uh, you, I'll come to uh, utility computation. So usually uh, agent derives its utility, utility based on what payoff it gets, right? Uh, what is the payoff it is getting? Here we just change the utility computation uh, as follows. So here assume that uh, agent A is the transcendent agent and it um, 
identifies with some other aspect in the system, let's say O. And uh, o, uh, o derives some uh, payoff, let's say pi i of O. And what happens is since A identifies with O, A gets a scaled utility of that. So uh, gamma to the power D times pi i of O is the utility which A gets because O is getting some utility and we sum it for all uh, aspects in its identity set. So we will we'll sum it for all objects in its uh, identity set. And this is the normalizing factor. So what happens is uh, there is a unit sense of self which is distributed across multiple aspects. And uh, because others are getting some payoff, this agent also gets some payoff because it identifies with those things. So uh, to uh, depict it pictorially, right? Uh, this uh, this plot will this pie chart shows that. So let's say there's an agent which identifies with itself, its family, its team, country, world, and so on, to with increasing distances, and we just change the gamma value. So gamma was the uh, transcendence level or elasticity elasticity, right? So gamma, let's say we set to very uh, small number, let's say 0.3. So what happens is 70% of the utility the agent derives from itself. So what payoff it is getting and rest 30% it derives from other aspects in the system like uh, family team and so on. On the other hand, uh, we keep the distance as same, but we just increase the uh, gamma value to let's say 0.7. And now we see that 30, only 34% of the utility it derives from what payoff it gets and there's 64% uh, 66% uh, of the utility it gets from other things in the system which it identifies with. So this was just uh, to get the idea of how the gamma and D works. Next, let me move ahead to the prisoner's dilemma scenario. So prisoner's dilemma, as we know, is a very well-known uh, scenario where there are two agents and both of them face this dilemma, whether they should cooperate or defect. And as we know, there is no rational incentive for the agent to cooperate in this kind of context. DD state is a Nash equilibrium and choosing to play D is like the uh, rational choice for the agents. So here, let's say what happens when we introduce transcendence. Uh, so this is how the utility equation changes. Uh, so AI is the payoff which agent I gets, but it also gets uh, gamma to the power D times BI. So BI is the payoff which other agent will get, and this is the normalizing factor. So uh, using this, uh, we plot uh, the expected utility of C and D. Uh, and on here, on the x-axis, we have uh, the gamma value. So we vary the transcendence level of the agent. So let me point out here, when the gamma value is zero, it's basically the traditional agent, uh, right? Uh, rational, rational agent. So here, E of uh, D is much higher than E of C and thus, like we uh, discussed, there is no rational incentive for the agent to act in a cooperative manner. But as we increase this gamma value on the x-axis, what we notice, uh, it makes more and more sense to act in a cooperative manner. And at ga gamma equal to one, it literally fl flips. So it makes as much sense to cooperate as it may made uh, when uh, gamma was equal to zero. So the point here is that the more an agent identifies with the other, that is, that is, it transcends. The more it makes rational sense to act responsibly. Yeah. I'm sorry. I wanted sure. to just say at the beginning, mm -hmm. we should have said, "Do you want questions during the talk or at the end?" Yeah, yeah. I, I know it's fine. Yeah, I, I can take it uh, on the way. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so my 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 question then is, it's not really a question. It's sort of, is this this basically captures something like a theory of mind? Um, uh, kind yeah. of. Uh, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't, don't. So basically, yeah, uh, the the agent in a way uh, knows uh, uh, about what how the other agent is and so on. So in cool. some ways we we look at it. Like Thanks. That. So yeah, uh, basically uh, the point again here was that uh, it, it makes rational sense to act responsibly by just changing its sense of self. Like you need not enforce a uh, rational choice uh, any longer in the form of rules and so on. The agent by itself would uh, take rational choices in these kinds of setups. And we have even tried it with uh, collusion and different kinds of game theoretic scenarios. But today, let's uh, see in some see the applications of CT in more realistic settings. Uh, and this is the work which I even presented last week at the AMAS conference here uh, held at Excel London. So let's uh, discuss about CT in supply chain. So supply chain context, we have modeled something as follows. So basically there are, there are some sellers or source agents, and then there are aggregators, which are collecting orders from multiple uh, sellers in the system. And then there is a buyer who will uh, get the um, order finally. 
and we have modeled it uh, and the dilemma is basically faced by the intermediary so the intermediary has to decide uh, how long should it wait how many orders should it accumulate before it ships the order to the destination and uh, we have modeled it something as follows so we create a, a random graph and erodoshana network where the nodes have different roles they can be a sender and intermediary or a receiver and uh, the intermediary has the following dilemma should it forward or should it wait uh, in dispatching the orders and this is how the payoff matrix looks like and how the dilemma pans out so let's say agent i is the intermediary if it forwards uh, the orders which it has accumulated so far it it incurs some transportation cost. We are calling it the van cost here. And uh, since the source agent had sent it some orders which were finally uh, forwarded, it incurs some utility. So some utility minus we uh, uh, remove, uh, take into account how, de how much delay was there in the system. On the other hand, uh, if uh, agent I decides to wait, it incurs some inventory cost, like bookkeeping cost, we are calling it. Uh, and uh, even the source agent gets a negative utility because it has sent some orders, but they are not uh, being forwarded so far. They are still in the uh, supply chain. So both of them get a negative utility. And here, uh, the shipping costs are usually much higher than bookkeeping costs. And thus, again, uh, there's no rational incentive for the intermediary to forward the orders in the system. But things would, won't work out, right? We want the intermediaries to keep on forwarding the orders and so on, so that the supply chain uh, is working uh, as expected and the orders are getting uh, moving in the system. So uh, in this context, we are tracking following three uh, indicators. Uh, first one is total cost. So basically how much cost each uh, node incurs. And uh, so uh, this is a co uh, co combination of both storage cost, like uh, how much it uh, cost it incurs in storing the goods in its warehouses and also transportation costs. So uh, when it decides to ship its orders, uh, the transportation costs are factored. Utility is the net profit uh, uh, gained by each of the agent. Uh, so this is specifically for the source agents when they get up, when their orders are eventually dispatched, they get a utility. And finally, in again, in supply chain context, it's very relevant. How much is the average delay per order? So these three metrics we are tracking. And uh, we have modeled three kinds of agents uh, to see how uh, it pans out. First, we have selfish agent, which is uh, like a agent which is trying to minimize its own cost. So it is looking at um, how how are its bookkeeping cost and uh, transportation cost, and it decides to uh, forward or wait based on that. Next, we have a virtuous agent. And in this context, the virtue is minimizing delays in the supply chain. So it, it tries to minimize its own delays. Uh, and uh, this is how it uh, does that. So, And finally, we have the transcendent agent. So in this case, the intermediary transcends to the supplier or the source agent. And uh, so we can see the equation looks similar, right? So this is the utility which it gets. And this part scaled by gamma to the power d times as a utility the source gets. And uh, based on this, it decides whether it should forward or wait. So next, I'll move on to the results. Uh, and uh, these are the three plots for utility, cost, and uh, average delay. So what we observe here is uh, for uh, the green plots show uh, for different values of transcendence or gamma value, what we saw earlier, gamma equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and 0 0.9. Uh, and uh, orange one is the selfish agent, and the uh, blue one is the virtue delay agent. So what we uh, interesting point to note here is that as we increase the transcendence level, of course, the agents uh, incur greater cost, but it also uh, results in lower delays. And uh, another point I would like to highlight here is, uh, especially this last plot, right? Uh, uh, the transcendent agent, even for like transcendence level 0.4, it, uh, it has a lower system level delay than virtue delay agent, which was trying to minimize its delay. So the virtue delay agent was trying to minimize just its own delays, but uh, this agent uh, is able to do better even than that kind of agent. So in supply chain kind of context, uh, it makes uh, it, it gives pretty good results in this manner. And also, uh, these plots are just to show that uh, different supply chains uh, have uh, give importance to different kinds of scenarios. So let's say if the supply chain is about perishable goods, then in that context, delay uh, delay is very crucial. You can't, the delay, if the, de if the delay is too high, then the goods go bad, bad and so on. So delays are important. In other settings, let's say, uh, 
uh, very huge products and so on, there uh, the shipping costs, transportation costs are higher. So the point here is that using CT uh, by varying this gamma level and D values, it gives the flexibility like in that specific scenario, how do you set the parameters so that it is relevant in that context? So that is one more advantage of CT. Like it gives that uh, adaptive feature that's specific to the supply chain in that kind of context, what is, uh, what is the benefit? So I think, yeah, that was the first application. And we can move on to the second application, which is uh, CT in traffic lights. So um, we have done simulations on a small four cross four grid. So let's say these are uh, these are the four intersections and each intersection looks something like this. Uh, there are uh, incoming lanes from four directions. And in this case, the uh, traffic light at each intersection is a uh, transcended traffic light kind of, where uh, the, the dilemma it faces is, I should turn green for which lane? Uh, which incoming lane among these four lanes should I turn green for? And uh, in this context, we have uh, simulated following four kinds of uh, traffic lights. So first one is cyclic traffic lights. So these are the regular traffic lights, which are, they have a fixed time cycle. So they'll operate in a loop and turn green for a fixed duration and so on, it move in a cyclic manner. Next one is max Q length. So these traffic lights based on, let's say cameras and sensors, they can figure out how many vehicles are waiting on each of the incoming lanes. And then it turns green for the lane, which is, uh, having the maximum Q length. Uh, third one is max waiting time. So we can even uh, figure out how long the vehicles have been waiting on that uh, queue. And uh, it turns green for the lane, which has the maximum waiting uh, uh, time. And th uh, last one is our model of uh, transcendent agent. Basically, what it does is it uh, accounts for how the traffic looks like at the neighboring inter intersections, and then decides uh, uh, how, uh, sh uh, like in which direction should it gre turn green for. And I'll elaborate more on that in the next slide. So what happens is, uh, let's say uh, traffic light I uh, uh, is the one uh, which has to decide uh, in which lane, like north, south, east, west, it should turn green for. Let's say we take the first row. If it turns green for the north, uh, northern uh, incoming road, then uh, the neighbor gets a utility because the vehicles which it sent got cleared, right? So it gets uh, Q length, uh, like how many vehicles were waiting in the northern road times some car utility. And other three uh, in, uh, incoming roads, uh, the traffic lights there get a negative utility because the vehicles they, they have sent, but they're still waiting at this intersection. So these three get a negative utility. And similarly, it happens for other uh, directions as well. And then this is how the utility computation looks like. Uh, similar like we saw in the earlier case. So uh, negative utility for um, the three uh, row, three lanes, which are uh, red and still waiting, plus, uh, and we scale it by gamma to the power D, and uh, positive utility for the uh, lane which was cleared, which turned green. And then we normalize it off. So this is how, uh, using this equation, this transcendent traffic lights uh, decides for among these north, south, east, west, which lane it should turn green for. And these are some uh, results for the uh, four cross four grid, which I showed. So basically uh, we compare uh, the average vehicular speed and average waiting time. And we see that uh, traffic lights perform better for both these metrics. So the average vehicular speed is higher and the waiting times are lower. So um, yeah, that's uh, like in a way, uh, at least at a small scale, it shows that um, uh, traffic lights uh, using these kinds of models do well. In future, we plan to do it on more realistic ro road networks and in different kinds of scenarios, like different kinds of traffic conditions, different modalities and so on. So I think yeah, with that, I'll conclude. Uh, the uh, to reiterate some of the points. Uh, so sense of self basically is, we think is an uh, elusive concept which hasn't received enough uh, attention. And we think that it might be a way to uh, build re intrinsically uh, responsible agents. And uh, also another thing which we want to try out in future is like depending on the specific context in which an agent is operating. How do we make sure, how, how can it curate its identity? How can it decide what all things should it identify with? So that is something to try out in future. And uh, another thing is uh, for humans, right? It's very hard like uh, to make humans identify with something a lot 
uh, more is required. But what we believe is uh, for autonomous agents, things are simpler. Uh, it's easier for autonomous agents to make sure they identify with uh, things which are relevant in that kind of system. So probably this would be more useful. And uh, finally, yeah, CT basically is even uh, shows to be very useful across different kinds of multi-agent applications, uh, realistic applications, like we saw supply chains, traffic management, and so on. So uh, yeah, with that, I'll conclude. Uh, these are some of our publications. Uh, recently, I also presented at Thomas. And yeah, so these are our te team details. Uh, yeah, thank you. I know I'm open to any questions or feedback. Yeah.